was born in Birmingham. I was born in St Chad's Hospital on the Hagley Road, which is no longer there. I think it's offices now. And I grew up in Moseley, and then I grew up in Northfield. And I worked in London for a while. I went to Birmingham University as well, so I made a decision to stay in Birmingham to do my degree. So I'm Birmingham born and bred. As a historian, you get an overview of how Birmingham's been seen in the past. And one of the main things that you hear if you're a decorative arts historian like I am is that products manufactured in Birmingham invariably tend to be, they, people say the word rubbish about them, or brummagen is the word that people use, particularly from the late 18th to early 19th centuries. Essentially, most people think that all that happened in Birmingham was that we mass manufactured cheap goods which were then exported all over the world, and that's not really true. It's always problematic to talk about what happened in architecture in Birmingham in the 60s and the 70s because the people that implemented those changes were very influenced by the modern movement in Europe and they thought that they were doing it for the social good. So for example the idea particularly around the ball ring development was that the car is paramount, the car will remain paramount, pedestrians aren't quite so paramount anymore so we need to build a city for cars. But you need to know the reasons why before you can appreciate it. But it's difficult because a lot of the beautiful, very brilliant Victorian buildings, the terracotta buildings, what happened in Chamberlain Square, all of that got swept away at the same time. And it's only with hindsight that we look at that now and we think, oh my goodness, that was a beautiful building. So I'm afraid I'm very much in both camps because I'm very much a modernist, but I'm also a huge fan of Victorian architecture as well. So what happened in Birmingham was very interesting. There's architecture from all sorts of periods, all sorts of styles in the city centre and it's a real mix of old and new. There's some fabulous Art Deco buildings, there's John Maiden buildings, as I've mentioned, the NatWest building and the Central Library. Birmingham was most famous, I think, in architectural circles for its terracotta buildings, those huge, great Victorian buildings of Birmingham. If you know where to look, there are hidden heritage sites all over Birmingham. So it's a very exciting place, there's lots and lots of heritage, but you can go out and discover that for yourself. It doesn't necessarily have to be you know, a museum or a gallery. Just take a walk and look at the buildings or look up and look at the details on the buildings and you'll spot stuff everywhere in Birmingham. So the pub started out as a parsonage for Birmingham Cathedral because we look out over Birmingham Cathedral and the parson there had his own private library 
Um, but as over the years his private library grew and grew and he became known as this person who had this spectacular private library. Um, to the extent that the Birmingham Free Library took it over in 1820 and they hosted it for 40 years. Um, and then in 1860 the parson had to, well the church had to sell it off to fund cathedral repairs. Um, at which point the Joint Stock Bank took it over and it became the Midlands Stock Exchange effectively. Um, it, that lasted for quite a few years and in 1889 Lloyds Bank took it over and it was a Lloyds from then right up until 1996. And then Fuller's came in and um, took over the pub and they've retained an awful lot of the original features and they're really proud of its heritage and are doing everything they can to shout about it. Well, the Fuller's are a London brewery, but they just decided to take a chance a bit further afield, and they took a chance by opening a theatre here as well. Predominantly, we host plays, but we're interested in pretty much anything, so long as it's quality work. I mean, we have a lot of stand-ups here, we have some music. We do everything that we can to support local theatre groups. I mean, we've got, we're just starting up a series of um, workshops to help theatre practitioners and writers and actors and we're trying to make ourselves the, a base, a networking base for all the local work and then we're going, to off, we're going to offer them discounted rates so that we can genuinely support new writing and feed into the creative communities in Birmingham instead of just feeding off them. So many great pubs to shout about and, and that goes in every direction. I mean you can go up towards Aston, you've got the Barton Arms and you've got Jekyll and Hyde and go down towards Digbeth and you've got um, the uh, Old Crown, which is a 14th century pub. And then right across from it you've got um, Spotted Dog, which is Boone's only Lithuanian Irish pub. You and, and they're all fantastic and and obviously we slot into this as well and right out out back, face, we, sh we share our back alley with the Wellington, which has hundreds of Cascales. And these are all kind of really exciting pubs. Birmingham's one of those cities that it's not immediately apparent what the, the variety of offering. If you, you can come to it as a tourist and not necessarily realise it's not on your plate. But if you look and find it, it's fantastic. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how much we work to make sure everyone knows about the theatre, we still get people coming up every day going, I didn't know there was a theatre here. And that's what's great about Birmingham. There's so much that's sort of just beneath the surface if you put in a bit of effort. So we're the oldest working cinema in the UK. Uh, 1909 uh, we opened, although there's a lot of competition for that title. Um, I'm pretty sure we're right. Um, so we, we've been a number of things over 100 years, a number of names. We've been the Tatler, we've been the JC. Uh, we were originally the Electric, which is why when um, the current owner, Thomas Laws, bought the cinema in uh, 2004, he renamed it back to the Electric to get back to its original roots. It started off as one screen where the, the seats would go all the way to the back and you'd, you'd come in and go straight in and it'd be a series of cartoon reels. Uh, cartoons and, and newsreels, sorry. Uh, then later on it was taken over by the JC and uh, they would go and shoot their own news, um, and like local news and bring it here and then there'd be um, uh, distributed newsreels from around the, the country which would get to us and you'd show that on a loop along with cartoons as well and a lot of people would bring, uh, like parents would bring their kids and put them in and let them sit and watch cartoons for a couple of hours while they went shopping at the, the, the ball ring as it was then. Later on in the 60s we were a, um, uh, an adult cinema showing at one point uh, both cartoon reels downstairs and adult films upstairs. In fact his previous guys uh, owned by a chap called Stephen Metcalf, it wasn't an adult cinema then, it was just a, uh, a, 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 a an art house cinema but not ran fantastically well so it, it got ran down and the, the, the um, screenings although pleased a, a small amount of sort of art house enthusiasts uh, didn't make enough money to keep the cinema alive unfortunately so then when we took it over we decided to make it into a boutique cinema and still show art house in foreign language but show mainstream things as well so that we can stay afloat. The staircase in the lobby that's probably one of the the oldest things in the building and that that's authentic art deco. Um, the uh, box office out in the lobby as well that's probably one of the oldest things in. I've seen footage of uh, from the 50s people 
uh, coming and using that exact box office and buying tickets and also cigarettes and then coming in here and smoking and seeing films. I don't, I'm not too sure too much else is sort of authentic. Certainly very little of it is 1909 um, original, but Art Deco is, is the era where most of it has been, but a lot of it is replica. We, we've got this wonderful dichotomy that we are the oldest cinema in the UK, but with the absolute state-of-the-art technology. So we've got two screens, we were digital in both. We were actually the first cinema in the West Midlands to have a digital screen. Uh, we've got fr a 3D system in both, it's uh, called an expand system. It's an incredibly state-of-the-art 3D system. It's it's the 3D system which James Cameron insisted Avatar was premiered on because uh, it's, it's, it's recognised as one of the best. Each individual pair of glasses is about £40 worth of technology rather than the disposable ones that a lot of, sort of the multiplexes have. We're, we're licensing our screens so we find that a lot of people who come here uh, come like uh, with their with their boyfriends or girlfriends or husbands or wives or whatever and they, they get a bit dressed up and they come out they have wine they have cocktails and it's a night out and um, it works well for that fifteen twenty eight when Henry VIII conferred the park, which were um, hunted by the Earls of Warwick. Therefore, the park was created from the hunting grounds. With the metropolitan boundary changes, of course, we became part of Birmingham. Previously, it was Warwickshire, but the park still remains Sutton Park. The size of the park is uh, reputedly 2,240 acres. Um, and I believe if you run round the perimeter as we did, if we got the timing right, you can get um, seven and three quarter miles from that. It's very diverse in its uh, ecology. We've got wetlands, we've got the heathlands, we've got the woods. It obviously being an urban park also, reputedly the largest one in Europe. Um, it's, it's a big balancing act because of the fact that it's a national nature reserve, but it's also an urban park with a very high usage by the local population. Our Exmoor Poets, for instance, um, they've been a great success too, as a herd of 31. Um, in the main, they're left to their own resources. They have their favourite places in the park. And uh, you know, they're, they're very good at survival. They don't have to be shod. You know. They don't have wolf shoes, so they're very, very strong, tough little ponies and they do give another dimension to the park. Because I'm involved with it, I tend to think that everybody knows about it. As you just said, there are some people who don't, so it does, it does raise a question of whether one should raise the profile, but because there are so many sensitive areas of the park, the protected areas, um, it's this very difficult balance between people enjoying it and also maintaining it. Maybe they're not interested in green green spaces, but I think the people who are would know about it. I think sometimes Birmingham doesn't, because it was traditionally a great industrial city, and it was one of those great industrial cities in the late 19th century. We have lost our huge manufacturing industries from Birmingham, without a doubt. And I think sometimes today, as the city's reinvented itself, it's not quite sure how to portray itself outside the city. And the students that I know, the undergraduate students that I know who come to Birmingham, love the city and most of them choose to stay here. But it's that, the perception of the city outside Birmingham that we have to work on, I think.